uh, announcement that you made yes it is important uh, been a lot of things going to the society booth and the most they've said pretty much everything covered up everything that I wanted to say as well but the most important thing that we need to emphasize on is if we have differences of opinions respect 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 no matter what uh, there's a problem you see go to the coordinators and speak to them and I'm pretty sure they'll be able to understand and try to make everyone comfortable try to make everyone comfortable inshallah uh, the next thing we have uh, MSA president, she has some announcements regarding the MSA. It's really quiet in here. Assalamu alaikum, guys. <laughs> That's just like, you know, like take a deep breath. It got really heavy here. Um, so I just wanted to make a couple announcements because we do have a lot of events coming up and we really, really, really want all of you guys to come out to these events. Um, let me just quickly go to the list of events that I have. Okay. Um, so the one that's coming up the soonest is actually next Wednesday at 6.30 in 3101 Canal Building. We're going to be having an event called uh, Walking the Path to Well-Being, Mind, Body, and Soul. Um, so if you guys are feeling stressed and all that kind of stuff, uh, inshallah, this is the place where you can learn about how Islam can kind of help you with like your self-care and all that kind of stuff. So that's happening next Wednesday, 7th, 6.30, Canal, 3101. Um, inshallah, bring your friends to open to everyone. Um, and then another event that we're going to be having is actually on the 11th, so that's next Sunday. Um, we're having Dr. Reda Bader come in to do a lecture. Um, the lecture is titled, The Companions Are Hiring, Do You Qualify? So this is kind of like to know what kind of characteristics the Sahabis had and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's happening at 2 o'clock um, next Sunday. It'll be in Israeli Pavilion, uh, 132. Um, so yeah, invite your friends, come out. It should be really good, inshallah. He's a very good speaker. Um, and then another event that we're having, um, so this is going to be February 16th. This is the Friday right before like the reading week starts. Um, this event talks about subjects of Islamophobia, uh, racism, and mental health, and how that kind of works within the Canadian justice system. Um, so this event is actually in collaboration with uh, the Student Union at U Ottawa, um, the GSA, and OPRIG. Um, so this event will be happening 6.30 at U Ottawa, but we are organizing a shuttle bus. So if any of you guys are interested in going, we're going to be having a bus that leaves Carleton at 5.45 and hopefully get you to the event on time. Um, so this is a really important event. Um, I really, really highly encourage you guys to invite friends, Muslim or non-Muslim, everyone is welcome to come. Um, we also are having a senator that will be at, on the panel um, talking about the justice system and all that. So inshallah, I hope to see all of you guys there. And then last but not least, um, this is one of the funner events. On the 18th of February, we're planning to have our annual ski trip. Again, this is in collaboration with Mac Ottawa, uh, Mac, which is the Muslim Association of Canada, I think, and uh, the MSA at U Ottawa. So inshallah, like if you guys are ready to go skiing, prices are around $45. The details will be released today. So if you guys want to keep an eye out for all of these events that I just said, Please, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of that stuff. Inshallah, we'll be having all the details there. So, Jazakallah uh, Khairan. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, the next part, Inshallah, will be by uh, Brother Ahmed Da'o, and he'll go through the uh, story of Prophet Ibrahim. Here's your view. Uh, one, two, three, four. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Alaikum, salam. Thank you. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Amr Dao. I'm uh, an alumnus here from Carleton. Uh, I did my bachelor's and master's here at Carleton and been involved in IW since. 2009 2010 way back when so I hope I'll benefit you somehow today so please bear with me I won't do any PowerPoint presentations or anything uh, what I'll do instead is I'm gonna sit on this chair and tell you a story and do my best to 
give you some lessons that you can take away for IW. Now, um, I highly encourage you guys write notes, uh, whether you have a notebook, a laptop, or your phone even. Um, I'm going to give you actual pointers to help you out. So keep those in mind. <coughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي so uh, the theme kind of for today is the quran and prophetic stories uh, one thing that i find absolutely wonderful about the quran is this is that you might read a certain verse or a certain chapter daily for years and then one thing you read or something someone told you or a video that you saw can change the way completely how you actually interpret that verse. This is something I like to look at as reading between the lines because you can read verses but it's about the lessons that you extract that you benefit yourself with and you apply to your life. So what I'll do today is tell you a story that you probably all know but inshallah, I'll do my best to give you lessons that you might not have caught while reading those verses. And that's the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim. See, the thing is, we all focus on tafsir, or the meaning of the verses. But not a lot of time do we focus on ta'amul, which is the pondering of the verses. See, the ta'amul is as important as tafsir. What's the, what's the point of knowing what the verse means if you don't use it to benefit yourself and benefit your life? So ponder on the verses. Take those lessons, extract those lessons from these verses and apply them to your life. That's what reading between the lines is. So you'll notice something in the Quran is that the prophetic stories are constantly repeated. Brother Muhammad mentioned that Sayyidina Musa was one of the most repeated uh, prophets in the Quran, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Dakir fa inna dhikr dan fa'al mu'mineen, that remind, because reminders benefit those who believe. And the more a story is uh, repeated, the more importance it holds. And one of those stories that was repeated is the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim. Just to give you a quick summary, Sayyidina Ibrahim, when he was given his message, he was in with, uh, he was living with people who worshipped idols. And so the first person he went to to try to convince to leave those idols and to follow him was his own father. And so just quick things to read the verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَدِيقًا نَبِيًّا Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts in Surah Maryam to talk about the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim. Where Sayyidina Ibrahim starts talking to his father and he says, Oh my dear father, why do you worship what does not hear, what does not see, and will not benefit you with anything? Whether it's there, whether it's not there, it's not giving you anything and it's not taking away from you anything. Why are you worshipping that? Ya <sighs> Abati. Oh my dear father, I have gained some knowledge that you haven't. You haven't received this, I have. So follow me and I'll do my best to guide you to the right way. Oh my dear father, do not worship shaitan. Because shaitan is the one who disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be like him, don't follow him. Ya abati, inni akhafu an yamassaka adhabun min ar-Rahmani fatakuna lil-shaytani waliya. Oh my dear father, I'm very scared that you will be touched by the torment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ar-Rahman, and you will become a follower of the shaytan. His father replies back to him, he says, it's like, um, do you not believe, so to speak, or do you not follow, like, do you disregard the my 
God's Ibrahim. لَإِن لَمْ تَنْتَهِ لَأَرْجُ مَنَّكَ وَهْجُرْنِي مَلِيَ If you do not stop, I will stone you to death. Leave me alone. Ibrahim replies back, قَالَ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكَ سَأَسْتَغْفِرُ لَكَ رَبِّي إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِحَثِيَّ Peace be with you. I will go make my own istighfar. I am going to ask Allah to forgive you because Allah kind of doesn't refuse something when I ask him. And I'll leave you and what you worship and I'll go worship my own God. So, a few things we can learn from that. And these are a few things that are very direct and how you can apply to IW. And this is where I want you to write some notes if you can. See, the first lesson that we learn here is that if you notice, uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim says, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, and another one, Ya Abati. You see, he didn't, he didn't say Ya Abi. Ya Abi means my father. Ya Abati means my dear father. Lesson number one. When you are talking to anybody in IW, learn their name. Learn what's the name that they want to be called the most. Like for example, if a, if a person is called Michael but prefers Mike, call him Mike. You'll notice something. When you're in a crowded place, don't you just sometimes hear your name somewhere? You just look around, just nobody's calling you, but you just hear it. Because people love to hear their name. It's the thing that attracts the most attention. So when you're talking to them, repeat their name every now and then. That's lesson number two. You notice Sayyidina Ibrahim said, Ya Abati, four times. Repeat their name every now and then. But don't be annoying with it. <laughs> it's like, Osama, you heard about this other thing, Osama? We saw it the other day, Osama. I'm just so good. Yeah, Osama, seriously. <laughs> it's a crazy thing, Osama. I got scared already. Yeah. Yeah, don't spam them with their name. People don't like that. But between every other sentence, why not mention their name? Attract their attention. Make 100% of the focus only fall on you. You'll notice that Sayyidina Ibrahim went to his father as the first people to go and talk to. And he was so invested in his father by saying that I am scared for you. I am actually fearful for you. This is lesson number three. Be invested in the person in front of you. You learn their name, learn their program, learn, what, learn the way they think. What do they believe in? Engage in conversation. This is not a monologue that you're going into IW. it's a dialogue. You are there to hear the other person as well as speak. But if you don't hear, then what are you going to say? Because I'll tell you, even though it is very important to have the posters and to do your research and everything, but you'll find something, and this is something that I commend the training team for doing, is that they're teaching you stuff that is not necessarily part of your subgroup. Because people don't necessarily come just to talk about your poster. They come to ask you different questions. They come to ask you difficult questions. So what you need to do is not just simply just answer the question. Engage in conversation. Find out what they think. Maybe they can teach you something that you don't know. Brother Muhammad mentioned something very important when he was talking. Arrogance. Do not be arrogant. Just because you're a Muslim and the person in front of you isn't, doesn't mean that you cannot learn something from them. And doesn't mean that you cannot learn something about your own religion from them. Lesson number four, be knowledgeable about what you're talking about. You see, this is something that was beautiful about Sayyidina Ibrahim, the way the verses just flows. See, he started off with, Ya Abati, uh, Why are you worshipping what does not hear, what does not see, and what does not give you anything in riches? See, this is something very smart that Sayyidina Ibrahim did. He didn't tell him, why are you worshipping idols? He gave the description of the idols. To allow the other person to think about it. Be knowledgeable about what you're talking about. Don't just, don't just give A plus B equals to C. 
throw a little X in there or something, you know? <laughs> Engage in conversation. This is what I'm talking about in terms of be knowledgeable about what you're talking about and add more knowledge to the person who is in front of you. Give them more information. Because at the end of the day, one thing that we're going to learn is that you do not guide these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, but your job is to be a messenger. And the best thing that a messenger can do is give as much information as he can. And one thing that I wanted to, actually, you know what? I'll write it down. Uh, keep this in mind every single time you talk, basically. Not just in IW, but in general. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسن Call to the way of your Lord with two things. The first thing is wisdom. حكمة And the second thing is الموعظة الحسن With good speech. This should be your umbrella whenever you actually open your mouth and speak. Do you know what you're talking about? Yes. Are you saying it in a nice way? Yes. Then go ahead. So you may have all the information in the world, but if you're saying it in a very horrible way, nobody's going to be receptive to what you say. And you might be the nicest person in the world, but you have no idea. if you have no idea what the hell you're talking about, nobody's going to be receptive to what you're saying. This is the perfect combination. So this is what I'm talking about. Know what you're talking about and say it in a nice way. Have good speech. This is the umbrella everything should lie under. And this is what Sayyidina Ibrahim does with good speech. See, this is something that just blew my mind when I read it. And this is what I'm talking about, pondering the verses. You'll notice something. Sayyidina Ibrahim says, Ya abati, inni akhafu an yamassaka adabu min ar-Rahman. Oh my dear father, I am scared that you may be touched by the torment of who? Not Al-Aziz, not Al-Jabbar, Ar-Rahman. You are talking about something as horrible as, I don't even know what the word is, but as torment. And you mentioned that the one who is going to do that is Ar-Rahman, reminding somebody that Allah's default is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. That this is the way of good speech. You don't just say what you're doing is wrong. You're going to go to hell. Seriously. What you say is that maybe what you're doing is wrong. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al ghafur rahim And even when you're talking about something as difficult. And as horrible as hellfire. You always mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al rahman That's what Sayyidina Ibrahim did. I'm afraid that you'll be touched by torment. From who? Ar-Rahman. So that's the lesson here. That always mention Allah's mercy with whatever you're talking about. See, the mercy is also something that everything that we talk about is engulfed under. Then after all this, Ibrahim's father says, If you do not stop, I will stone you to death. Damn. That's heavy. Your own father telling you he's going to stone you if you don't stop. And then he's telling you, leave me alone. How do you respond to that? And this is something that we learn from Sayyidina Ibrahim on how to deal with difficult people in IW. Which, by the way, they're going to come in all shapes and forms. Not to scare you or anything, no pressure. Um, he said, Salamun alayka laka rabbi. Peace be with you. I'm not going to do anything. I told you what I have to tell you. I'm not going to argue with you. You said you're going to stone me. I'm not going to argue with you. This is something that we learn with IW. Will listen, are we at right now? Lesson number what? Two. Huh? Lesson number five? Lesson number five. Or six, something. Uh, 
when dealing with difficult people, this is my own opinion about it because it's been working for a while, don't, get, don't engage in long debates. And I'll tell you why. If someone comes attack mode just to, just to attack you, Islam is a religion of terrorism. You guys are terrorists. I don't even want to accept anything you're talking about. And they're still there. If you want to tell them your peace, tell them your peace. Tell them what you have to tell them about how, no, they're wrong. And if they continue in that attack, then you just tell them, listen, this is what I have to say. If you don't like it, then don't. In IW, this is something that's very important. You're not forced to stand there and take attacks from people and cussing from people. You don't, you don't have to stand that at all. If somebody comes and attacks you, tell them, listen, this is what I have. You don't like it, you don't like it. You can go ahead and leave. But this is what I have. Why do I not like engaging in long debates with these people? Because this is where pride takes over. You are no longer talking to these people in order for them to, to know the truth. You are now talking to them just to prove yourself right. And they're doing the exact same thing. They're just trying to prove themselves right. And so there's no benefit in you two just bickering and screaming at each other. Whatsoever. So do what Sayyidina Ibrahim did. Salam and alaik, just peace be with you. Obviously don't be impolite. Be very polite. Say, listen, this is what I have. If you don't like it, ah, sorry about that, you know? But you don't have to stand there and take screaming from people and people cussing at you. And this is something very important. If you don't know how to handle it, just ask somebody else to help you out. Asking for help is actually uh, something that people, uh, that the training team is kind of encouraging you guys to do. And then, uh, lesson number six. Seven? Seven? Six, okay, thank you. Um, this lesson is for you personally. See, this is something that's, uh, that's also been helpful in my life. See, Sayyidina Ibrahim, after he dealt with all this, especially from his father doing all that, and he said, Salaamun Alaikum, he dealt with it perfectly. Then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, فَلَمَّا تَزَلَهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ When he left them, and what they're worshipping without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقُ وَيَعْقُوبُ وَكُلًّا جَعَلْنَا نَبِيًّا We gave him Ishaq and Yaqub and we both made prophets. See, uh, this is something for you as people. You may go through a lot of difficult things in life. And what Sayyidina Ibrahim went through was having no relationship with his father, his own family. But he did it for what the truth is, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we rewarded him, we gave him family, we gave him people who will love him, and we gave him people who are righteous. This is something for you guys. What you're doing in IW is just mind-blowing. The amount of reward in it is just fascinating. And be sure that anything you're struggling with because of the work with IW and whatnot, and any extra work that you're doing, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make your life easier, going to make your life happier. Because we all want that. Uh, these are a few things from the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim. I'm keeping it nice and short. But I just want to add a few things, which is. Again, your job in IW is not to convert anybody. Your job in IW is simply to give a message. And that was the job of Sayyidina Muhammad His job was not to convert anybody. His job was a messenger. That's it. Do not think that you failed because nobody said the Shahada. Unfortunately, a lot of IW volunteers in the past thought that. I didn't convert anybody, that means I failed. No, that's not your job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides who he wills. Your job is just to give the message. And obviously an extra cherry on top if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides someone through you. But that's not the goal. That was never the goal with the prophets. So that shouldn't be your goal. So if you think that was, kind of check your intentions, so to speak. And 
lastly, I want to do something that we've been doing for I, in IW for the longest time, but uh, I don't know, it got lost over the years. Can I please ask everybody to stand up? Please. Okay. Put your hands on your heart. And repeat after me, okay? If someone comes to you and says something that you don't know the answer to, this is what you say. Me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer. Let me direct you. Let me direct you to someone who can help you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Let me direct you. Let me direct you to someone who can help you. You got that? There is absolutely no shame in saying, I don't know. I don't know is your best friend. Do not make stuff up on the spot, please. <laughs> I beg you. I have seen my fair share of volunteers trying to do that. Please don't do that. MashaAllah, you have a very knowledgeable team around you. If you don't know an answer, ask someone for help. If you can't find anybody who can help, which I doubt. Tell them, I don't know the answer, I can't help you out with that. But don't make something up on the spot, please. Thank you. <laughs> Again, I don't know is your best friend. There's a saying that says, Man qala la alam faqad afta. Whoever said, I do, I do not know, it's as if he gave a fatwa. Someone asking your fatwa, tell him, I don't know. As simple as that. Remember this, only talk about what you're like wise about, what you already know, what you researched. If there's something you don't know, something you're unsure of, don't say it. You might do more harm than good. There is one last uh, lesson that I'd like to add that I already mentioned before. Do not, and I repeat, do not let your pride take over when you're talking. It does, unfortunately, a lot of the time. You're trying to prove that you're right in front of the person, uh, to, uh, to the person in front of you. No, listen. That's all you need to do, listen to the other person. Try to understand what they're saying, try to understand where they're coming from. Engage in conversation. I repeated this a few times because it is very important. Your job is not a speaker, just saying things that you memorize. No, it's to engage in conversation with these people. Maybe one of those people that you engaged in conversation with really needed that talk that day. And maybe you changed their life to the better. Don't let pride stop that. Okay, Jazakumullah khair, and thank you for listening. And I'm sorry if I bored you. <laughs> So, yeah, multiple lessons just from uh, six verses from Surah Maryam, story of Ibrahim, lessons that we have to implement during the week of IW and during our life uh, in general. Again, I mentioned this verse in the general meeting. Amr also mentioned it again. I think you should always, whenever you're there in the week of IW doing research, always remember this verse. Wa ila sabira rabbika bil hikmati wa mawaibat hasana when you invite people, invite with wisdom and good speech. So wisdom, you do your research. You gain more knowledge. That's the first part. Then if a question comes, you don't know how to you, If you know how to answer it, then you did your part, you did your research, you have knowledge, you can answer it. With, of course, authentic sources. The second thing, if, if a question comes, you don't know, you say, I don't know. I'm already emphasized a lot on it, so I don't have to talk about it again. Second thing is good speech. Smile. And whenever, whatever you say, make, it, make sure it comes from, from a good intention and say it in good words as well. So the intention and when, when, when the words leave your mouth as well. Jazakallah khair, brother Amr again. And so the next session, inshallah, is break? Yeah. Okay, so five minutes, ten minutes? Okay, so ten minutes break and then we'll come back, inshallah. So, 2.27. Uh, so my topic was, is supposed to be a discussion. But um, I don't know how much of it 
can be really a discussion. I think it's a philosophical topic. Uh, not philosophical, but it's a... I don't want to say a deep topic either. It's just a, a thinking topic, so it would require a lot of time for discussion. It would need hours uh, upon hours of, of discussion if, if we go into discussion. But as I'm going, I'll try as much as possible to um, give questions, try to see answers, um, and then we'll go from there. So the topic, inshallah, that uh, I'll be covering is uh, predestiny versus free will. Okay, so qadr and free will. So this is, uh, and under this big header, there's a whole bunch of other questions that also uh, can be common <laughs> Uh, can be commonly faced when you're an IW. And also, before I start, I don't want to scare anybody off. Usually, the people who come and speak to you in IW, the vast majority are the nice people who are not going to uh, attack or anything. However, they might have hard questions, but they usually they're not, uh, I guess, jerks about it. They're, they don't um, attack you or anything like that. I haven't experienced it, uh, but my experience in IW is also a bit limited. It's only maybe what, one, three, three years or four years. And the reason why I'm saying limited is because I know people who have seven and eight IWs and so on. Uh, okay. So predestiny and free will. Complementary or contradictory? Because uh, people say, okay, well, if, if Allah, if, if there is Qadr and Allah knows what we're going to do and He has decided already for us uh, what's going to happen, then why even bother and so on, um, and all of these questions. So, do we have free will or are we helpless uh, against Allah's destiny? <coughs> so, the first thing we need to think about is what is it that makes us different than all the other uh, beings. So in this verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, at, at the end of the verse uh, about uh, Bani Adam, about the sons of Adam or human beings. So we have um, preferred them over much of what we have created. So there's a whole bunch of things that Allah has preferred uh, humankind over all the other uh, creatures with. Um, one of which, or the one that I'm going to be focusing on today, is the, uh, the intellect, the ability to think, right? Allah, get, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created with us brains, we have an intellect, we can think, we can make decisions, we can make choices, and so on. Now, the question becomes, well, uh, with that intellect, if Allah gave us intellect, that that means that we are capable and we are asked to make choices, right? Otherwise, Allah wouldn't have given us this intellect, right? Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in another verse that I don't have here, He says, if we wanted, we could have descended upon them our ayat in that verse, but then again, what exactly does ayat mean? Allah alam, or it goes up to the tafsir. That would have made them compelled to obey us. So if Allah wanted for us to have no free will, no choices at all, he could have also done that. Which is the case, for example, with angels. Angels cannot disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that for a fact tells us that we do have free will in some of our actions. Bear with me and I'm gonna to get to the uh, completion of the question. The other part is, well, can you, for example, decide to stop your heart from beating? You can't, you can't stop your heart from beating. Can you stop yourself from growing? Just naturally, you're gonna focus all your energy and then you stop growing. You can't do that either. Can you, for example, live for forever without drinking water, for example? Everybody has certain capabilities, but after a certain point, you're not going to be able to live without water. And those are the things that you have no control over. 
you are exactly like an animal or like a plant when it comes to these things. They need water to survive, you need water to survive. They're going to grow, you're going to grow. You need food, they need food. Okay? So, in, for us to say everything is predestined is not entirely true. And if we say everything is in our free will, it's also not entirely true. So we have to split the answer and see what we have to choose on and what we can choose on. Now, certain things, certain aspects of our lives we have no control over, but then the things that we do have control over, we have free will in that. And then I'm going to get into Qadr a little bit later on. Now, in order to understand this topic uh, correctly, we have to have two bases upon which we uh, understand this topic. The first one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our nafs, or the soul, with equal tendencies to do bad and do good. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the, the soul, He creates it equally. So, um, I believe in Christianity, the, the belief is that you inherit uh, Adam's sin, right? So you inherit Adam's sin, so you're born sinful, and then through the process of uh, baptism, you are alleviated from that sin, and so on. But in Islam, we also don't believe that you are born naturally just good, and then everything else is kind of um, is added on. But you, you're, yes, you're born with a clean slate of sins. You don't, you don't, you're not born with sins, but you have the tendency to sin, and you have the tendency to do good. You have the tendency of both equally. And this is mentioned in more than one verse. So in these two verses, for example, so here it says, and by the soul, and he who proportioned it. But the more accurate translation in sawaha means he proportioned it equally. The, the word equally should be added to this. And inspired it uh, with its wickedness and righteousness. Both equally. You're born with both tendencies equal within your nafs. Okay? Another verse, Indeed, we guided him to the way, be he grateful or ungrateful. Okay? So, you, again, tendencies to both equal. Another verse, And we have shown him the two ways. Notice again, now the word for way here and the word for way in the other one are different, but it shows us the same message, that you are born with the tendency to do both. So you're not born with a tendency to be bad, right? And you're not born with a tendency to do good. So the predestiny is not that you're predestined that your soul, you're already born with a tendency to do bad and then you have to overcome that. And not the opposite as well. Because people always say, oh, well, if, if I'm bad, then why is Allah punishing me? Nobody ever asks, well, if I'm good, then why is Allah rewarding me? Because we're very selfish sometimes, right? So you're born with a tendency to, to do both and then your actions determine the rest. The other part, which goes hand in hand with the first rule, the second rule is Allah only burdens you and judges you according to your capabilities. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that your capability is seven out of 10, he's not gonna test you with eight. He knows that this is the seven. Now you can fail and you can pass. That doesn't mean that because that's within your capabilities, you can, you can pass. I'll give you an example. I, what I do is I teach for a living. Okay? When I started teaching, I wasn't teaching in university. I was teaching grade threes and grade fours in math. Now, if I go to that fourth grader and I tell him or her, please integrate x cubed plus 2x, <laughs> is that student going to fail or pass? <laughs> Bearing a miracle, they're probably going to fail, right? But that is because it's beyond their capabilities. They never learned this. They never got to that level. Now, if I ask the same fourth grader, what's 3 plus 2? OK? Now, can they fail? Can they get it wrong? Yes. Can they pass? Yes. And I know it's within their capabilities because we solved it in class. It wasn't the homework. I explained it. You took 
uh, addition and subtraction before, you did a similar problem before, and you did it right more than once. So I know that that student's capability can get the right answer. They can pass it, they can, but then they can fail because they didn't study, they weren't focused, they procrastinated, they didn't sleep, whatever the reason is. So Allah does not charge us with something that is beyond our capabilities. And that is in, in the very, uh, I guess, famous or well-known verse, uh, and Allah does not charge a soul except within his capacity. Okay? So, and this is because Allah is the all just. Now, for me, for example, when I'm giving that question to the student, now I can be unjust, right? Maybe I would think that this is within the student's capabilities. But maybe the student has certain uh, learning disabilities or something that I didn't know of. And then that question would be unjust. So I'm still, there is a chance that I'll be unjust. But because Allah is the all just, his justice is infinite. He knows for a fact that when he gives us a certain task, he knows that we have the capabilities to pass that test. Okay. Okay, so the question comes from this verse now. Umar sallam rasul illa bi lisan qawmi la bainahum fa yudhillu Allah man yasha wa yahdi man yasha wa huwa al azizul hakim. So the, the part I want to emphasize here is the part in the middle. And Allah sends astray whom he wills and guides whom he wills. Okay, so this is a big question for a lot of people who are not necessarily Muslim. Okay, and by the way, to a lot of Muslims, I've heard this in more than one dinner conversation with people. I say, okay, well, if Allah can decide who he guides and who he misguides, what if Allah decides that I'm from the misguided? So why am I even being punished for that? Right? Allah is the one who chooses who's guided and who's misguided. So, like, why even bother? Why even be punished for this? Um, so, or, or maybe if I have the question here. So what about guidance? Why does Allah guide some and does not guide others? Why does Allah pick and choose? And if he didn't pick someone to be guided, why are they punished and vice versa? So I'll stop here and I'll take some answers. Anybody have guesses? Yeah? Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like also Allah should see in you that you really are striving to find the truth. Mm -hmm. Like you need to have that feeling because some people just say, you know what, I don't care. Like whatever happens, happens after I die. I guess I'll find out when I die. So that's like not an attitude that Allah would guide us that. Okay. So it goes kind of along the same lines, right? So you have to actively seek. Allah or actively seek, uh, put in effort, basically, right? Or get closer to Allah for, for that guidance. Any other answers? Yeah? You have to be tested before you get judged. You have to be tested before you get judged. Yes, that, that is true. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to probably uh, bring up the story of uh, the uncle of the Prophet. Yeah. So I have this on the next slide. Okay. Yeah. Should I not say? No, no, you can say it actually. Okay. Yeah. So basically, the uncle supported the Prophet Muhammad a lot. Mm -hmm. But we know that he's not going to Jannah. Yeah. Although, because although what he did was good, so the act itself, supporting the Prophet, people, the chief men of Quraysh came to him, they wanted to transgress the Prophet Muhammad. He didn't. He protected him. He provided that protection. He was good to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He provided a service to Islam, but it's as they already said. It's when you come closer to Allah, you and not only by action, by intention, mm -hmm. by an, an, uh, uh, an understand, an internal understanding and comprehension of what the religion is, and how do I make myself closer to Allah? Mm -hmm. The reason why Abu Talib did not. So of course, uh, guidance from, uh, comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But there, another reason is because he had that pride that, oh, I should not leave the religion of my forefathers. Mm -hmm. So it's you coming closer to Allah, 
within yourself internally, even if you do good actions, that's the most important thing. Yeah. One last one because. Uh, I'm like, when people say like it is written, right? So when something is written, it's what? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. So when somebody says like something is written for you. Right? Yes. Yeah. So something could be written for you. Something could happen to you. But what you're judged on is how you react mm -hmm. to what's done to you or what has happened to you. So when somebody asks, like, okay, so God just chooses everything we do, like why why are we judged? But really, it's like we're not judged on uh, so we're not judged on the things that happen to us, but what we do, and that's not really what like is controlled by God. He might know what we're gonna do, mm -hmm. but that's not something that He chose. Okay, yeah. perfect. You're jumping ahead. I'll get to that, but that's, that's, that's correct. Okay, so basically you guys pretty much answered it, but the key to really solve this mystery is the, these verses that I think I put two asterisks here so that nobody says, oh, Ahmed is a kafir, he's saying there is contradiction in the Quran. <laughs> so there is what seemingly looks like it's a contradiction. So in the first verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءْ So this is the verse that came uh, addressing the same story that Usama mentioned about the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, uncle, when he wouldn't uh, accept Islam. And says, indeed, O Muhammad, you do not guide whom you like. You do not guide whom you like. And then in another verse, in a different chapter, uh, at, the, at the end of the verse, Allah Taala says, "Inna la tahdi ila mustaqim." You guide to a straight path. So, in one verse, Allah Taala is telling the Prophet, peace be upon him, "You do not guide who you will." And in the other one, he says, "You are guiding. You guide to a straight path." So, how can this be possible? How can he guide, but not guide? Whenever there seems to be something conflicting or contradictory, maybe we're looking at the thing completely wrong. It might be that Allah is referring to two different things. And that is basically the case here. So let's see. Guidance should be looked upon as two levels. Okay. So the first level is the general level. The, the word I'll, I'll use in, in, in English, because it's very hard to translate things uh, from Arabic, is a directive or an informative guidance. Okay? And this is for everyone. Believer, non-believer, someone walking down the street, anyone who's breathing, they get that guidance. Okay? And that guidance, even for people that we know, did not, at the end of the day, believe in Allah. And an example to that is the people of Thamud. So in, in, in this verse, وَمَّ ثَمُودْ فَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ فَاسْتَحَبُّ الْعَمَى عَلَى الْهُدَى And as for Thamud, we guided them. Okay. So if we, if we guided them, then what happened? They preferred blindness over guidance. So can we say, oh, the people of Thamud are going to Jannah because they were guided? No, we know they didn't go to Jannah. But they were guided. Again, I'll, I'll go back to uh, my experience as a, as a teacher, as a professor. Let's say you go, you're teaching in a class. And then you say, you guys, it's on the outline, you tell it to them in the first day of classes. If you want to do well in this course, there are suggested problems. These are the suggested problems. There is office hours. If you do the suggested problems, if you have any questions about the suggested problems, you can see me during the office hours. You can see the TAs in the office hours. If you don't do them, then you're probably not going to do so well. Okay. So that is for everyone. Good students, bad students, hardworking students, lazy students, no-show students, everyone. Everyone is entitled to that. Okay. But then, some people decide to solve these problems, suggested so problems. Some people decide to come to the lecture regularly. Some people decide to come see me in the office hours if they have questions and so on. Some people say, you know what? I don't care. I'll teach myself. 
You know what, this guy is boring anyways. He has a thick Egyptian accent. I don't want to go to his class. He's boring. I'm texting anyways. Why would I go out in minus 40 degrees weather? I'm just going to stay home. Some other student will go, they will solve the, the, the suggested problems. They're like, oh, you know what? I need help with this one. Well, then they come ask me, can you just uh, help me with this and so on? And then I say, okay. Now you came to me, you solved the suggested problems and everything. Let's get through this together. And then we'll start solving. Ah, oh, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. If you do this, it's going to be easier for you. If you do that, it's going to be easier for you. Does all the students get access to that? Do all the students do that? No. Because that is a second. And I'd like to call it the supportive or assistive guidance. Okay. And in this verse, Allah kind of states it clearly. So those who were guided, he increases them in guidance. So if they were already guided, how can he increase them in guidance? So tell them some more. Like for example, the, again the example in the in the class. Tell them some more. Guys, I have office hours. You know I have office hours. I mean that's not going to get anybody any good marks, right? So that means it has to be a, another guidance, and that's basically what it's saying here. You have a certain level of guidance, and those who take the first level of guidance, and those who are guided, he increases them in guidance. Okay. So then now we, we ask the question, so who is, the, who is those who are guided and who, is the, who are those who are misguided or, or led astray, right? Going back to the question. Now when we want to answer this, these questions, there is a thing in, in, uh, in, in the Islamic studies, it's like a, it's an index, okay? Where you go, for example, you want to search for a certain word and you want to see where it occurred in the Quran, where is it mentioned? And then it refers to the verses. Uh, alhamdulillah, there was a, um, a, a like a, a website I saw that listed most of the verses, but I know it's not all of the verses because there is a verse missing. But we will look very quickly at the verses that uh, mention either guidance or misguidance or those who Allah will not guide. Okay, we'll go them through them very quickly. Okay, so. And Allah sends astray the wrongdoers. Okay. Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. That's another verse. Concerning the hypocrites, Allah sends astray and so on. The good ones. Allah chooses for himself whom he wills and guides to himself whoever turns back to him. So people who turn back to Allah. Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. Um, those who believe in what has been revealed to you those are upon the right guidance from Allah those who believe and done righteous deeds uh, those who dis uh, disbelieved Allah leaves astray and guides to himself whoever turns back uh, those who believe in Allah and hold fast to him he guides them to himself and Allah does not guide one who is a transgressor and a liar um, the betrayers Allah does not guide. Uh, those who do not believe, again, uh, Allah will not guide them. Those who dispute Allah, Allah, uh, Allah will misguide them. Those who are skeptic and transgressors, Allah will lead astray. Uh, Allah will lead astray the disbelievers, uh, those who take their desires of their own gods, or worship their desires, the defiantly disobedient. And then I can just summarize them in a table. And you see that there is certain categories, right? Mm -hmm. So those whom Allah guides, so Allah doesn't just leave it, I guide, I guide someone, I misguide them, some, and then you say, oh, so Allah just picks and chooses. You will be guided, you will be misguided. No, it's not, it doesn't work that way. In order to understand something, you have to look at the whole picture. Okay? And Allah mentions specifically, who are those who will be guided, and who will those who will be misguided? And if you see here, those people are the ones who took the first level of guidance. They took a step towards Allah. Just like 
most of you who answered said. And these ones are the ones who, who didn't, right? So again, going back to my teaching example, somebody's like, oh, this guy, he doesn't know how to teach. I don't know how to teach. So don't blame me later on because I didn't help you because you already said, I don't know how to teach and you didn't want to come seek help or anything like that. Same thing, wrongdoers, liars, cheaters. Oh, if, if you ever cheat, pray to God you don't come to my class. <laughs> okay? Define the disobedient and so on. So let me move on a bit rapidly so that we don't run out of time. Now, how does Allah guide and misguide or sends astray? Allah mentions it in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, verse, and it basically uh, gives us a picture. Uh, so whenever Allah wants to guide, he expands his breath to con contain his lamp. And whenever he wants to misguide, he makes his breath tight and constricted as though he were climbing into the sky. And this actually, later on, uh, a lot of people we're, we're saying how this is also one of the scientific miracles of, of the Quran because you know when once you go up let's say if you go in the airplane the oxygen levels drop the the air pressure drops and that means also it's harder for you to take a breath and so on so they didn't have an airplane without pressurized uh, cabinet at that time and unless you went to for example uh, Mount Everest which was kind of far away from Arabia, you wouldn't have experienced that. Okay. So then what about Qadr? Now th this gets us to Qadr. So we already discussed uh, guidance, we discussed free will, whether you have free will or not, and so on. Now what about Qadr or predestined? So if everything is already known or written by Allah, then why even try to change it? And if I'm bad, then I was just meant to be bad. So there's two points to answer uh, this question. The first one is that the whole concept of predestiny is that you don't know it. It's unknown. It's unseen. If you say, I'm already meant to be bad, that is <laughs> contrary to believing in color. Because if you already know that you are bad, then the, the, that's not color. Color is only known to Allah. You don't know if you're born to be bad, and you also not, don't know if you're born to be good either. Right? So saying, oh, I'm already meant to be this, is not true. Uh, so that is the first thing. The second thing is that Qadr is based on Allah's infinite knowledge. So it's more an indication of his all-knowing attribute. Okay, so this is a bit hard to understand because again, we always like to understand from our own um, human logic perspective, which is, okay, let's say you go, um, I don't know, just uh, let, let me use the same example. So let's say somebody goes and they uh, they have an allergy okay there you go they have an allergy now if you know that somebody has an allergy let's say you know somebody has a peanut allergy and then they went and they ate something and they fell sick now I can say oh that probably the food probably had peanuts and that's why that person fell sick because they have a peanut allergy okay now if that's a common occurrence, I'm probably going to be right. That doesn't mean that I put the peanut in the food or I force that person to eat the food with the peanuts or anything like that. But just because I know that person has peanut allergy and I know that store has a lot of peanut products, most likely, again, because I'm a human, most likely that person fell sick because of peanut allergy. But if I know the person so well and I know all of the external and internal factors that are surrounding a person, I can say with a hundred degree of certainty what will happen in the future. And that is basically what Qadr is. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He created us, as we said in the beginning, with equal tendency to do good and to do bad. But He knows what will happen, the external factors, and how we will think about it and what our choices will be. He did, but at the end of the day, our choices is our choices. The key word here is our choices. 
you are the one who is going to be taking the action. It's just that Allah already knows what action you're going to do because he's all known. So then the, the last question is, okay, well, if that's the case, why believe in Qadr? What's the point, basically, of why do we have Qadr? What's its function? How does it help us? Now, for starters, the answer is we will never know for certain. We will never know for certain. However, the, the scholars have discussed this and they have talked to, about it in length. And the, 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 the majority, like the, the opinion is as follows. As human beings, we are given the ability to think, the, what, what we said in the beginning. But with the ability to think gives us hardship of choices. Okay? You're going into university, you're going to choose a program. <laughs> You're afraid, am I going to choose the right program? Is this program right for me? Am I going to like it? Am I going to dislike it? When I graduate, am I going to find a job? Am I not going to find a job? When I find a job, will I like the job in the future? Is it going to be well-paying or not? Am I going to get fired? That's just to choose what you're going to study. Okay? If you want to buy a car, same thing. Car, what about this? I don't know if this store is good or bad. Maybe they're stealing, maybe they're hiding something from me, and so on, all of that stuff. Well, when I get the car, maybe I'll find something hidden. You want to get married, same thing. Is this the right person for me? Is this the bad person? What about something I don't know? What about in the future if they change? What about this? What about that? The, the ability to, to make a choice also comes with a heavy burden of consequences. You're always thinking, what will happen? What will happen? What will happen? Is this the right thing or is this the wrong thing? You're always under that pressure. And that is when, when the, the, the scholars uh, interpreted this verse, this is what it referred to. We have certainly created man into hardship. This is the hardship of the everyday life. What should I do? What decision should I make? And will it be right or will it be wrong? Now, will Allah just uh, create us with a hardship without any solution? No. Okay? So we have to continuously remember um, <coughs> that Qadr helps us live with the choices we make. Because if we are always worried about the consequences of our actions and our choices, it becomes debil debilitating at some point. So Qadr makes us live with the consequences of what happened and the possible uh, outcomes of something that we will do in the future. So, and even, even for past events, even for things that have happened in the past, and we think we know that, oh, this probably was the wrong decision, right? Even in that case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in these verses that this, it might not be the same as what we're seeing. Uh, and as for man, when his Lord tries him and is generous to him and favors him, he says, my Lord has honored me. But when he tries him and restricts his provision, he says, my Lord has humiliated me. And notice how even when the Allah favored him and he was generous to him, Allah started with the, the verse with, when his Lord tries him. Because that's also a trial. And the next verse, Allah answers to that, says, kalla. No, definitely no. Why? Because that person that Allah has favored, he gave him health, he gave him wealth, he gave him knowledge, that same person has more responsibilities. And if they don't live up to those responsibilities, they will also be judged on not fulfilling those responsibilities. So if you are a person who is very wealthy, you say, oh, see, Allah loves that person. He gives him all the money. Money, he's swimming in money. MashaAllah. Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> okay? But then at the same time, if you, miskin, you can't buy coffee from Tim Hortons, <laughs> you're not asked to help people go to Hajj, for example. You're not asked to help the poor, you're not asked to help the needy. You don't, because you are the needy. 
your skin, you, you, you need coffee. <laughs> right? So, no, because at the end of the day, you will be judged on what you have. If you have more, you have more responsibilities. Same thing with health. Somebody who's healthy and so on, and a, a, a guy who's old and, and he's sick and so on, and then the, the sick guy says, yeah, yeah. I used to, when I was your age, I used to be a horse. <laughs> I used to be a soccer striker. Okay. <laughs> but then at the same time, that person, if he sees someone struggling, they're not asked to help that person up, but the person who's the horse, they need to help the person up, right? And the same is, is vice versa. So I, I think I, I already talked about this point. So now to conclude, I'll go back to the first thing that we mentioned in the, uh, in the discussion, which wasn't really a discussion, <laughs> which is, yeah, 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 last minute, oh, last, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I gave 10 minutes because I knew people wouldn't take uh, everything back to back. So back to the inspired nafs or the soul. And this is as explained by Ibn Qayyim. A soul, it, it, the, because there is different um, mentions of the soul or the nafs in the Quran. So Ibn Qayyim said there is one soul, one nafs, but it has three different forms. Okay. So we said Allah, uh, the soul has been proportioned and it has guided to, uh, to wickedness or righteousness. The first form is an nafs al amara bisu, and that's the soul that is persistent in joiner of that soul is that someone who is just doing wrong and they don't like they don't care. They don't nothing. Like Pharaoh, for example. That is someone is doing wrong, he's not even blinking, he's not thinking twice about it. The second form is the basically the most common one. Is the, the, the interpretation change is either the hesitant or the changing or regretful soul. So you do something wrong and then you start Revise yourself. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Should have done. Why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that, and so on. So you start kind of revising your own actions. And then the third soul is basically what alleviates us from the hardships, the kebab that was mentioned in the first verse, which is the an nafsul mutmainna, the serene soul. I don't know what's the here. It says the reassurance soul, the serene soul. That is, you take actions. And you know that there is, when you take actions, there are so many external factors that you have absolutely no control over. But because you have trust in Allah and you believe in Qadr, you, are, you have this calmness and serenity within you that no matter what the consequences of what happens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will either reward me or, or, or punish me if I, I mean, if, if I did the right thing, Hopefully, inshallah, he will not punish me. Okay? And that's, I think, the conclusion I took, what, 10 minutes maybe, over time. My bad. But I think that's it. JazakAllah khair, and I hope it was helpful. And <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. Oh, one second. Please, please. <laughs> I think you went deaf. Uh, I also, I said I, I teach, right? So. I'm always big against uh, plagiarism, so most of this content, if not all of it, is... I have to reference, of course. <laughs> references don't count in the word count. So, uh, so the reference is uh, Sheikh Sha'rawi, I think, if, anyway, again, I'm Egyptian, so it's very cliche. But Sheikh Sha'rawi is basically, it's based on his lecture and his writings and so on. So, Jazallah khair, may Allah bless him and uh, bless, him. bless you for the presentation. So, uh, no more announcements other than Please, please make sure you take attendance before you leave, and uh, because it counts as if if you attend two out of uh, three of the like uh, seminars and one out of the two workshops, it counts. So please uh, make sure you sign in the sheets. And what else? Food. Food. Yes. Food. Uh, same place like two weeks ago. Yeah. So you just go down and then take the tunnels. Uh, and I guess that's it. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, Subhanallah, we call up the Lizard, and we have some fun, 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 and we have